Hello and welcome to Unity of Salem's online service. I'm Reverend Patty Williams and it is truly my joy to join with you in spiritual communion as we come together in prayer this morning. Hmm, sweet spirit. We truly come together and open our hearts. Open our minds, open and receptive to the living spirit of truth. Knowing that as we join together on this magnificent day, that we are truly joining together with the one presence, the one power. And we call it all good, for we call it all God. And we give thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Amen. Hello, my name is Danita, and I am your platform assistant today, and I have a few announcements to share with you. Our Monday noon meditation will be held in the office and not on Zoom. You're invited to bring a brown bag lunch for fellowship afterwards. Our drumming circle with Madge Pinecoffer was moved to Saturday, June 19th at 5 p.m., the weekend of summer solstice. Everyone is welcome. It will be held outside under the awning. 
Joanne Icovino is recruiting volunteers to plan and coordinate our 50th anniversary celebration. And Kay DeRoshi is, ca is calling for those willing to serve on the welcoming signage team. If you are called to serve on either of these ca ca capacities or would like to serve in other areas, please call the office. Interested in more information about our community activities? Our web, on our website, you can sign up to receive our weekly email. Please join us in singing, I am so blessed. We now join together in affirming the Unity of Salem mission statement. Unity of Salem nurtures spiritual growth in inclusive, loving community. And our vision statement, centered in spirit, we create a world of unlimited peace, love, and joy. Our core values are inclusiveness, spirit-led, compassion, love, joy, and integrity. I now invite Joan up to serve for our, share our reading for today. The word for today is comfort, and our affirmation is, I find comfort in the spirit of God within. As I focus my attention on my inner world, my awareness heightens and I, meet, and I rest in a deep and enduring trust in God. 
This abiding spirit provides me with the lasting assurance that all is truly well. I allow my life to resonate with this divine presence. My time of prayer and reflection is an opportunity for me to fully realize my spiritual identity and meet life from the place of faith. Here I discover wholeness and satisfaction in the deepest core of my being. My heart finds comfort in the feeling of peace and serenity. I feel a deep nurturing love that warms my heart. Whatever my direction, wherever I go, I find comfort in the assurance that I am a beloved expression of infinite spirit. And from John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Thank you, Karen and Stove, for such a beautiful um, interpretation of the Lord's Prayer. And to Angela Barb and Dale for, for sharing that with us so beautifully today. So for the next few weeks, we are, are going to be looking at coming to a new understanding of this prayer that Christian societies have been giving a lot of power to over the years. And, and in fact, even in unity communities, um, 
some have looked at this prayer as having its own power, its own ability um, to do things. I was in a community once where they would not change the words of the Lord's Prayer because they felt that each phrase represented some aspect of our chakra system. So we've really looked at this prayer in all sorts of interesting ways and given it some power that that I think um, was not necessarily what was originally intended, um, that we've lost the intention that Jesus had when he was offering a model of how to pray, not words to pray, but really showing us how we can express um, God more fully in our lives. If it were the words that he was sharing, what words would we use? I mean, the words that, that most of us know are a translation of a translation of a translation. Um, the most well-known form of in, in the modern translation comes from either Greek or Latin. I mean, that's really all we have it recorded in. Um, and those records were based on translations that had been shared predominantly orally of Jesus' words, but Jesus' words were in Aramaic. So they were translations of what he was speaking when they were originally shared. And, and the closest that we can come to the words of Jesus are in what is called the Peshitta text. And that text is actually um, a dialect of Aramaic that Jesus probably scholars don't believe spoke, and it is considered to be a fifth century translation of a Greek text. So it was in Aramaic to Greek and then back to Aramaic. So there's a, a few translations even going on there. So how do we know? How do we know what words to speak if it, if it was all about the words? We don't. It's about the intention. It's about the intention of our prayers. And, and yet I highly value the work of um, George Lamza and Rocco Erico, who really look at this Peshitta text and, and study the Aramaic in such a way that we can connect to the culture, to the understanding and the, the customs that were taking place at the time that Jesus would have shared these words. And here's what I consider one of the greatest gifts about the Lord's Prayer that I got from studying with Rocco Erico. And that's a deeper understanding of the word prayer. You know, the root of that word means to set a trap, you know, like a hunting trap. To set a trap, and, and in fact, according to Rocco, uh, the literal, one literal interpretation would be to set your mind like a trap and wait patiently to catch the thoughts of God. So you're not setting a trap for God. You're setting a trap in your mind to wait patiently for the thoughts of God. Or maybe less literally, the, he, he talks about the idea of tuning our mind into the radio station, the frequency of God, that that is what the, the word prayer, um, the original intention of that word means. So Jesus was attempting to teach a radical new concept of prayer. Not asking for something, you know, prayer, that's, that's the prayer that was most prevalent around him. So instead of asking for something, he was teaching us to affirm the presence of God. He was teaching us to claim what is already ours. He was teaching people how to transform their consciousness with affirmative prayer. Something else I learned from Rocco that completely under, um, transformed my understanding of this prayer, and that's the words that Jesus was using weren't even original. He was quoting from prayers that already existed within the, the community, within the society that were used in synagogues, that were used in spiritual gatherings. And he was bringing them to a new understanding using those same words. This is not the concept of the Lord's Prayer that I grew up with. 
There's no secret power in the words. There is power in the form of the prayer. There's power in the concepts that are contained within the form of the prayer. So over the next few weeks, we're going to seek to understand those concepts, you know, to look a little deeper at what they might mean metaphysically. Um, and what a, what a month to have this conversation during, than during the month that we celebrate Father's Day. I mean, I think it's the perfect month to be sharing and understanding at a deeper level this beautiful prayer. So the first affirmative concept we start off with is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Or as Rocco Erico says, our Father who is throughout the universe, let your name be set apart. You know, many would argue that the fatherhood of God um, reflects a, a deity that expects obedience you know, that expects us to, to, to come into line, you know, with him, to, to be obedient to him. And quite frankly, for me, for many that I know, that thought um, creates a rebellious energy. You know, that rebel in me jumps out and says, no, 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 that's not exactly how um, I do things. That's not what this is about. That's not the God that I know. So what if we thought about it this way? Jesus knew that the, the Hebrews, who were likely the audience that he was talking to, would pray to Father Abraham. They would pray to Father Isaac. They would pray to Father Jacob. So he was speaking to them in a form that they would understand um, However, their understanding was that these forefathers were the intermediaries that would commune with God on their behalf. And, and he was saying, no, you get to pray to God, our father. You get to claim a relationship with this presence and power. I mean, this is a substantial twist to what they understood to how they understood spirit worked in the world. You know, one of the other things I learned for Rocco, from Rocco Erico was that the word that, we, that is translated as father would have been more accurately translated as Abba, or uh, the word is Abba, and would it be more accurately translated as Papa, as something much more um, familiar you know, or dad or daddy, a, a concept that speaks to us of compassion, of love, of an intimate relationship. And it's a child's word. So when he used it, the people who were hearing it not only would have had a little bit of a shock because he was talking about a radically new relationship with God, with humankind, in Aramaic, it doesn't have gender. So they wouldn't have heard gender. They would have heard parent. They would have heard, you know, creator. They would have heard something totally different than what most of us hear when we hear the word father. They would have understood it, that Jesus was talking about a loving, compassionate presence. Because in a very real sense, Jesus knew God as the true parent. He knew God as the source of all, of the oneness out of which all is birthed. And yet I can understand the interpretation that he saw God as a father who loved all his children. I, I can understand where that comes from because he did teach his disciples to directly communicate with the father. But he also taught them in parables. He wasn't teaching them in a literal fashion. It was, there was a deeper meaning to absolutely everything that he taught. He taught that God exists without exception as love and as a loving presence available to anyone and everyone. He also knew that, that when we call upon God the Father, we are claiming our birthright 
as expressions of the divine. You know, we are claiming the truth of who we are. We're claiming that the creative power of the universe moves through us. You know, this is the shift in awareness that, that Myrtle Fillmore experienced that led to her healing from tuberculosis and eventually to the, the founding of this movement that um, we call unity. She went to a, a speaker, you know, having, having had a lifetime of being told she had tuberculosis and, and being told that she was close to the end of that lifetime. And she heard from this gentleman named E.B. Weeks that she was a child of God and that therefore she could not inherit illness. And that resonated with her so deeply that she worked with it for two years. And she worked with it in every cell of her being. And at the end of two years, there was no sign of tuberculosis present in any area of her physical body. And it, it could be easy to say, I'm a child of God. Maybe not so easy to um, embody what that means. To truly internalize the, the full impact of that statement. Um, and that's what I think we're being called to do with the, the beginning of this prayer. Our Father. You know, not my Father, not your Father. Our Father. Father, our creator. You know, Rocco Erico calls these first two words at the very beginning the first attunement. And we're attuning ourselves. We're changing that frequency on the dial. And he actually believes there are eight attunements within the prayer. So we'll, we will go through some of those over the next few weeks. In, the, in his book on the Aramaic prayer of Jesus, he says... Speaking about this first attunement, thus we proclaim and confess through the opening line of the Lord's Prayer our union with God and with our fellow humans who are all children of God. Again, this would have shocked the audience that was listening, whether they be Egyptian, Greek, Jew, Hebrew. Whatever their understanding was, man, woman, child, it would have shocked every single one of them because it was so completely outside of their experience that they were each and every one of them all expressions of the same creative energy. Well, aren't we? Each and every one of us equally expressions of the divine. Here's what James Dillett Freeman said. James Dillett Freeman, is, um, Unity's um, poet laureate, who has since passed but left some amazing writing with us, including the prayer for protection that we close our service with. So he stated, isn't, and, and we're talking about the opening lines of this prayer, isn't that a great way to think of God? God is love, and he is not standing off judging us. He is running out and saying, son or daughter, child, come into my arms. All I have is waiting for you. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave us this great vision of what God truly is, love. I think James said it very well. And this is the understanding of God that makes my heart soar. It's the understanding of God that drew me into unity as a teenager. So if the word father has too much baggage for you, and I understand that for many of us that might be the case, and it doesn't give you this vision that I'm talking about, if it doesn't connect you with a higher possibility, choose a different word translate it so that so that you can center yourself in divine consciousness so that you can center yourself in knowing the one presence the one power find words that you identify with and that that identify with you with a sacred energy you know it, we're talking about the energy that is right here 
the compassion, the love, the Christ consciousness that is the truth of who you are. You know, when you attend, this is the temple of God. That's what hallowed be thy name is. It's truly claiming as a, a child of God, this is the temple. This is where God expresses this body, this physical body, this being right here is an expression of the divine. So let's go um, back to the second part of that first line of the prayer where our father who art in heaven Rocco Erico says that it takes the second part to complete the first attunement. The term used that we translated as heaven can, can mean sky, can mean cosmos, can mean universe. So we're truly saying or implying that which is everywhere. You know, the one presence and one power. There is nowhere that God is not. So when Jesus gave us the Lord's prayer as an example of how to pray, he began by proclaiming that we should pray to the God of everyone who is everywhere present. How much bigger than that can you get? We pray to the cosmos, to the one source, to the universal power, to all that is. We align our thoughts, our consciousness with this expansive energy. So to take Myrtle's understanding just a little bit further, what does it mean to be God's heir? It means that the kingdom of heaven is ours. It means that, that God, you know, God's entire fortune is ours, that we are heirs to it. But we must claim it. We must claim our truth. We must claim that we are expressions of the creator, that, that not only are we expressions of the creator, that our life is an expression of the creative process that we create our experience in the same way that the universe was created, through the thoughts that we hold in our mind. And yet in those thoughts, we can choose to abandon God. We can choose to perceive it as if we were, ab were abandoned by God. Or we can choose to forgive ourselves for any thoughts of separation. We can see that ultimately everything is working out for a higher good. Everything is, is working through us to create the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus told us very directly on where heaven is. No matter what our biology or gene genealogy, we, we all share one father who resides in the kingdom of heaven. And that father is within each and every one of us. So where's heaven? right here, right now. It's, it's here. And it's expressing this in our lives that brings the kingdom of heaven into manifestation. You know, Abba, the compassionate one, the all-knowing, will always be here. Our I am is guiding us to a greater good, to a, a higher expression of our own unique Christ consciousness. What in our last series we talked about was this individual uniqueness, our individuality, God expressing through and as us. The one presence, the one power is all there is. And awareness of that is what we are seeking to know when we speak the words of this prayer in the form, not necessarily the literal, literal words, in the intention of what Jesus is saying to us. So to help us get an even deeper understanding of this prayer, um, I'm going to invite Angela to join me, and we're going to engage in a time of meditation in which I will share with you a translation of this prayer that came through Neil Douglas Klotz. And he is a, um, a religious scholar, an author, a Sufi. Um, he brought the universal dances of peace forward. 
Um, he's the co-founder of the International, International Network of the Dances of Universal Peace. And he has a number of translations um, of this text that are all geared towards this, this energy of transformation and seeking a personal understanding of God. So as Angela joins me with some music, I invite you, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes. And in this moment, to set aside anything which might distract you as you maybe firmly plant your feet on the ground. And take a deep breath. And as you exhale this breath, let go of any tension. Take another deep breath, breathing you know, deep within your heart. And maybe even deeper. And as you let go, let out a deep sigh. Let out all the energy that you might be holding on to and open yourself to the energy of the flow moving through you with each and every breath. Just breathe in and breathe out. At the close of this prayer, we will experience a moment of silence. And then I will close that with a prayer. O oh, birther, father, mother of the cosmos, you create all that moves in light. Focus your light within us. Make it useful as the rays of a beacon show the way. Create your reign of unity now through our fiery hearts and willing hands. Your one desire then acts with ours as in all light, so in all forms. Grant what we need each day in bread and insight, subsistence for the call of growing life. Loose the cords of mistakes binding us as we release the strands we hold of others' guilt. From you is born all ruling will, the power and the life to do, the song that beautifies all from age to age it renews. Truly, power to these statements. May they be the source from which all my actions grow, sealed in truth and faith. Amen. And as we bring this time to a close, I invite you to allow these words to continue to be the words of your heart. Spirit, I erase every sense of lack from my life. I dissolve every resentment against others whom I wrongly perceive to be blocking my good. As I forgive myself and others, I feel God's love filling my being and overflowing into all of my life. I am one with the power of God that dwells within me. In this day, there is only God expressing as me. May every choice I make today move me toward the kingdom of God in every 
area of my life. I am an instrument for expressing love. One with God. My life is blessed. And I am a blessing. So it is and so we let it be. Amen.
now is the time in our service where we come together to bless the financial gifts, the gifts of service that come to this community, and truly know that this is the bounty of God, that it is through these gifts that we achieve our desire, our mission, and do the work that is ours to do, and we bless these gifts with love and joy as we affirm our offertory blessing. Divine love, flowing in, through, and as me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, all that I have, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. Amen. We also include in this this energy of prayer, this energy of gratitude, those whose names are in the prayer box that is in front of me. And we invite you right now to use the power of your imagination and add to this box the names of those you might be holding in your heart, of your dear ones, your friends, your associates who might appear to be experiencing something less than wholeness. And we place these names in this box and joined together in prayer in truly knowing the presence of God, of truly calling on that universal presence, whatever name works for you, that presence of love, of compassion. And in this energy of the one presence, we know that there is nowhere that God is not that God is already at work in our lives and in the lives of each of those for whom we pray, calling forth health, wholeness, peace, prosperity. Whatever appears to be in lack, for God's will is the highest good. The divine will is the highest good for each and every one of us. We claim that truth and we claim it for each of these individuals for whom we pray and totally trust in God to be in charge, to know that the universe is at work. And in this knowing, we give thanks for answered prayer as we pray this in the name and nature of the one living Christ presence. Amen. God is my source. God is my power. God gives me everything I need. So I give thanks for all my blessings. God gives truly our source. And we now close this service with our prayer for protection, knowing that right where we are, God is. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. And the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. And we are truly blessed, always. Namaste.